And thanks again, everybody, for joining us. Today's going to be a fun conversation. Uh, our guest today, this is our the third in this webinar series on regenerative seed growers. Our guest today is Scott Scheimer. Uh, Scott and his team, his family, they farm out in Cheyenne Wells, Colorado area, so the eastern uh, part of Colorado. So if you think you farm in a tough environment, you'll probably not, it, it'll take a tough one to top Scott's tough environment. He'll talk a little bit about that, but it is a harsh, brittle, dry, arid environment out there. Uh, he'll talk a little bit about that. Now, those environments can be very good for growing high quality seed. Um, so we'll, we'll talk a little bit about some of those issues. But in addition to farming and growing seed for us, uh, Scott wears many hats, like the hat that he has on right now, Simple Farms. He'll talk a little bit about that. That's a, a farm management software package that that he has built. Uh, but, you know, our conversations, it may start in farming and growing seed, but we may end up in talking about growing shrimp and trading cryptocurrency. So who, who knows where this will go? So it's going to be a fun one. Uh, so Scott, so glad that you could join us. Glad that you are part of our seed growing team. Uh, we, we certainly, you know, in addition to that, Scott's customer as well, as you will find the majority of our seed growers are customers. That's how we got to know them first. We know that they are a good farmer, but just because you're a good farmer does not make you a good seed grower. So then we reach out and work with them to see if they'll get to see or which Scott is. So Scott, I go ahead and introduce yourself. Tell the folks a little bit about, you know, where you're from, your operation, background, some of that kind of stuff. Okay, Keith. Well, thanks for having me on. I greatly appreciate it. Um, yeah. yeah. When Jonathan asked, uh, let us know where you're at. That's definitely, I, it's hard for me to relate to most of you other guys. We are dry and arid. Uh, I took on the family farm for my granddad in, uh, what, 1991. Uh, I was at the age of 19 and uh, going to CSU, always wanted to come to the farm, just didn't realize I was going to be on that soon. Uh, so I've had a few years experience under my belt. Uh, through the process, when we first started, all you guys know uh, that was still at the point in time where there wasn't the Freedom Farm Act, so we were wheat fallow in this region, and at that point in time, my biggest concern was is if I farmed for 50 years and raised wheat and fallow, I was going to get 25 crops on one field, and uh, boy, I was going to have to perfect it, and I was going to have to figure this out, how I was going to do the best job, and you knew just with a 12 inch annual rainfall, you weren't gonna get that crop each year. Uh, 96, the world changed for us. Uh, we were able to switch up and start growing Milo. And that was actually the first year I lost a wheat crop. Prior to that, it was in great shape. We were raising crops every year, it was raining. And, uh, but we switched and added some Milo into the mix, uh, and some sunflowers. And uh, that kind of opened my eyes at that point, hey, we can diversify and start growing a lot of different crops. And, uh, then hit uh, 2000, and uh, I thought we could raise a 30 bushel wheat crop every year, no matter what we did around here, until 2000, and uh, we turned dry. I think we were two inches of annual rainfall that that next two years. Um, all we did, well, I didn't sleep at night. We ripped all day just to keep the ground from blowing, and uh, that's that's about all we did. And uh, we finally got going again. And uh, at that point, that's when I got introduced to green cover. And uh, looking at trying to keep life on the soil, that was kind of a key thing. Uh, we dabbled in that a little bit and found that it, it was a struggle with the rainfall. If we had dry years, we just didn't even have enough growth. Our ground was hard as a rock and uh, still exposed. So from there, we went back to just doing as much diversity in the crops as we could. Uh, today, we are doing millet, milo, corn, wheat, and uh, last year, introduced ourselves to green cover again and said we would love to try some rye and grow it more in the seed aspect and uh, so last year was our first year doing that and um just sold completely sold on it we did a little over 800 acres in variety test plots and uh, the residue we strip or cut it and uh, the quality with the grain was good and uh from there, we're just, we're, we're sold on going that way and very excited for the residue we're gonna plant through this year. We then have expanded that rye crop into, uh, I think this year we're at 1500 acres 
that we're doing for green cover. And we've introduced that rye uh, through millet stubble, corn stalks, milo stubble, everything that we had just harvested in the fall, we put that rye in. And uh, some of it didn't come up through the winter, but we caught some of those winter snows and uh, we got emergence. We went out and top dressed and uh, things look dynamic now. Very excited. Uh, everything's got a nice cast of green, looks solid. And my reason for doing that as well is, uh, you guys know it, looking at the wheat market and these prices, I am trying everything I can to get away from fallow in our region and uh, do something production. And my attitude for some of these rye acres were, we were having some weed pressures and uh, just didn't wanna go spend another $70 an acre trying to keep these weeds under control. So let, let's put the rye in. And uh, if we harvest a 12 bushel rye crop, we're still better off. We're gonna have some water residue and uh, we're gonna keep this weed pressure in check and uh, just get reset for that next corn or milo crop that we want to follow up with that stubble. And uh, so those are, that's, that's a quick background on my end, I guess, of where we're yeah, at today. Yeah. So Scott Ravencamp, who is our contract seed production guy, he works with all of our seed growers. So you know him very well. He used to farm in a very similar environment to you uh out there in, in Colorado as well. He he told me way back when he was growing seed for us before he was working for us. He says Keith, everybody in eastern Colorado should be growing rye and there should be no wheat. What makes rye better adapted to your environment there than what wheat is? I just from my experience, I mean I'm not I'm not a true agronomist. I'm just a farmer trying to write the checks. Uh, we would try to follow up our millet stubble with wheat. So we would get our millet in a little earlier than we would typically around here. So we could get that millet off and uh, just have a nice window to get that wheat in there. And it just, we have found each time the wheat struggles. It just struggles in that kind of environment. It needs a fallow period to really produce in this area. And uh, the rye, I'm telling you, right by my house here, we uh, had corn stalks. And after we picked the corn here in late October and just scattered in the rye, and then we put cattle on it to eat it, and they pounded in that rye, we got a little bit of moisture. And I think the big thing is, is that rye will come out of dormancy so much quicker in wheat and still give itself an opportunity and be ahead of the game. And uh, I think that's what's created as advantage over wheat. It's just a little earlier aggressive in the spring. We also, again, last year was our first year, uh, we're doing custom cattle care. And we thought, oh, we'll put some cattle on that rye. And uh, we got caught with our pants down. We were thinking it was gonna act like wheat and we had some time to get the fence up and get the cattle out there. And boy, once we got a little temperature and a little moisture, that rye grew so fast, we didn't have time to get the cattle out there and the fence up. So we. We kind of decided next time we're going to be a little quicker. The fence will be up, ready to go. and We'll just take advantage of a two-week window even to put those animals on and then move them on the grass right next to it. Yeah, I've, I've often said if you're going to you're gonna graze rye, you need about 1,000 cattle for a month. <laughs> and then, yep. You know, then they need to, to, to go somewhere else because uh, once it takes off, yeah. And, and part of that, you know, what you just talked about and described is why – cereal rye is the number one cover crop, you know, across the country, simply because it's so well adapted. It's such a tough plant, so deep rooted, has more residue, you know, cereal rye will germinate at 38 degrees. It photosynthesis, or I'm sorry, germinates at 34 degrees and 38 degrees and above, it will actually do some photosynthesizing. So just a really tough, resilient plant. I want to go back. You, you talked a little bit about the residue from the rye and how that was shifting and changing your whole system. Talk a little bit more about that. You know, how much more residue does it have than wheat? And then what does that residue do for the rest of your rotation, the rest of your system? So we've been stripper cutting. We actually got stripper heads before our planters were even capable of getting through the straw, the original planters we had. So we got out of the stripper heads because we just couldn't manage the residue. And uh, then we got newer planters, modified them, got back into the stripper heads because uh, residue's everything. For, for out here with 12 inch annual rainfall and then August turns to 105 degrees for one week with 30 mile an hour winds. 
I mean, if we don't have that ground covered, it's just, it's death for us. Mm -hmm. And I know everybody around here survived for generations plowing this dirt and planting the crop, but we know saving that moisture and preserving that, that profile with residue is everything to survive in this area. So wheat, uh, even, even by the next year, it's starting to break down. And by the time we're into July, August, we got nothing left on the ground. You know, that's telling us too, our biology is doing some work, but uh, the rye, what I've seen this last year, going over last year's stuff with the spray rig here just a couple of weeks ago to get the volunteer under control. Um, the straw is just so much heavier and stronger, a little ropier. Um, oh, it, a unique one was, as we did some trials for green cover as well, we did some hybrid uh, variety called Cover Max. And it went right as strip right through the middle of this Elbon that we've got out there. The Elbon, it's lodging a little bit now, that straw is. And it got a lot of wind on it, a lot of snow. But that uh that cover max, that's still that straw is still standing vertical, pretty impressive. And that stuff was almost shoulder high when we cut it. And uh I was very impressed with that. You can just see that differential line even you know since harvest last year on that. Um, but our planter's rigged up. We can get through it. We can move it out of the way and uh, just open up a nice strip. I don't run strip tillers, uh, just a full no-till right through that. And uh, very excited about what kind of mat we're going to have out there. We feel like, too, we got some tools in our toolbox. Uh, we work with Elevate Ag, and uh, we're using their biologicals and have been for quite a while. Uh, we can talk about that. I think that's helped our quality a ton. And um, but also we went out and we just put some of their product called HyperCycle on. So we're going to break down that residue. And we did it in zones, uh, mostly on the irrigated with the residue was a lot heavier. We didn't touch the dry land corners and uh, see how that breaks that down, making nutrients available to us, but also allowing us to get it through with, with the planter a little easier. Yeah. And and I think that's, that's such a good point. You know, the, I mean, that residue, it's, it's residue because it's high carbon. But that carbon has to be the base of your whole system, your whole rotation. And so until you start having problems with too much carbon, you should be trying to produce as much carbon as you can. And before you go out and, and you know, do a tillage pass or even, even do a, a biological to help break that down, make sure that you do have the best equipment possible or your equipment is adjusted as much as possible. Because having too much residue early on may be a problem, but you will never have too much residue later in the summer when that next crop is growing. Cause you're right. It, it, it helps the infiltration it cuts the evaporation, all those sorts of things. So even if you have to sacrifice a little bit on the front end to have that residue out there later uh, is such a huge thing, especially in a very brittle environment, like what you guys are in. So uh, so yeah, we we can. I definitely want to talk about the biology and how you see that, you know, changing what you're doing and changing your system and the quality and all that. But I do before we go there, I do want to go back. You talked about weed pressure as well, and I know even before we started the webinar live here, we were talking a little bit about you know weed issues and weed pressures. How do you see? Your rotation, what you're doing, how do you see that affecting your ability to manage weeds as compared to you know, maybe some of your more traditional neighbors who are still just doing wheat fallow? Yeah, uh, the big one where we had talked to Scott Ravencamp about was uh, where are we going to put our rye? And I had explained to him that I have a, a section with three circles and then the rest dry land corners. And uh, it's one well three pivots, limited irrigation. So we were finding ourselves doing a variety of different crops on each of the circles and then something else on the uh, dry land corners. And uh, we were getting to where drift or anything else, we were just getting terrible escapes and weed pressures that we were having difficulty management on the perimeters until we hit the point a couple of years ago that the pigweed just took that field over. And uh, you know, we even had agronomists from Bear come out and recommend on our soybeans what to be putting down. We threw the kitchen sink at it and we ended up doubling it up and still didn't get control. So uh, Scott had mentioned, hey, why don't we try rye in that zone? I mean, it is aggressive. It will choke things out. And so we went in there, um, put the rye in, harvested it. When I'm sitting in the combine, I'm the guy in the combine. I'm the guy in the sprayer. Uh, 
I was in that combine. We had very limited plants out there. I mean, just did it. That rye was really aggressive and really choked on that. We choked that wheat pressure out. Uh, and grasses. It, it just dominated in the grasses. I mean, we had just such limited pressures that we had seen in zones that were so bad years historically. And uh, then I followed up post-harvest, went out there with the sprayer, threw down the Roundup. Actually, it wasn't Roundup. I hit it with Gramoxone. And uh, even sitting up in the sprayer, you know, weeks later after a little moisture, we just didn't have the pressures out there. But I went ahead and put the chemicals on just to get that final cleanup. Uh, so moving forward, our game plan is, is is we're trying to avoid as much herbicides as possible, throw rye in the rotation, and use it to really choke out some problem areas. And that's what we've done this year on a few fields. And uh, so there's still more to be said. Stay tuned. But uh, we're excited what we think it'll do for us there. And those fields, that rye didn't come up till this spring, but it's already a full stand. Already got strong stooling. And uh way ahead of anything else coming out of the ground. And uh, I'm hoping that really gives us a choke pressure on it. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, we, we've talked about this, you know, in other webinars, other articles and stuff, you know, the rye has the ability to control weeds. It's It, it easily controls early weeds, you know, winter annuals, mare's tail, hen bit, things like that. They just don't exist in a rye field. But in order to get the later season control on weeds, you know, like what you're seeing, you have to let that rye really grow out. So growing it for grain, like what you're doing is one solution. If you're in a more uh, lush environment, you know, as you move east into the corn belt and stuff, those guys are letting their rye get five feet tall, rolling it down and then planting their beans into it. And they get weed control deep into the summer because of that. Now, obviously you can't do that in an arid environment, but so your option is you say, well, okay, I I'll grow the rye as the cash crop and not, you know, try to, you know, plant that, that spring planted crop. So how is it socially <laughs> being the guy in wheat country planting all these acres of rye? Yeah. Uh, you know, the younger guys don't have much of a, opinion about it you gotta have the older guys have approached me through the winter at school athletic events uh <laughs> i hear you're growing rye and uh you know you better be careful and what i try to remind these guys is the last time we were really fighting rye was when we were tillage we were fallow wheat and uh we uh we didn't have sprayers and roundup and uh since then i've told these guys one neighbor i even thanked him or didn't thank him i uh he says, you better not get rye on my property. I said, well, I owe you for all the sambers you gave me on my property. Uh, just we'll trade it out. You know, we're just all fighting a new dynamic um, with Roundup and all the different rotations. Even for us, anything that's following the, this rye will be either Roundup ready corn or will be the, uh, the new uh, herbicide resistant Milo that you can control grasses with. And we actually do a rotation that the Milo follows the corn or vice versa. So we get two years of uh, grass management out of our, our our next crops that follow that rye anyway. So we are taking that approach, but really in the end aspect, every tank mix we're throwing out there, unless we're doing top dressing on wheat has got Roundup in it anyway. We, we've got to address it with all the other grass pressures. So I'm not so concerned about that. You know, it's funny the way the neighbors are handling it, but uh, I, I'm being neighborly as well. Uh, when we go out and harvest the first two rounds on the perimeter, uh, we windrow. We're running stripper heads, so you're not leaving much residue on the ground anyway. But instead of spreading the chaff, we'll actually windrow it. And then once we get deeper into the field, we'll, we'll put the spreaders back up. Yeah. And yeah, that is that that's that's good and thoughtful. You know, and, and for people that are listening, if you're not from wheat country, you don't understand <laughs> why this is an issue for people. You know, rye was the weed or maybe still is the weed when you're doing continuous wheat. When you're growing nothing but wheat, rye is an opportunist and it's going to find its way in there. And and then what happened is, you know, that rye became feral and it and it developed lots of hard dormant seed. And so it laid out there in the seed bank for many years. But that's completely different than the rye that Scott's growing for us that we're selling to people. You know, that does not have dormant seed. It's not feral. And so it's a it's a different animal. And and really that rye growing in those wheat fields is a symptom of 
not having the right rotation more so than anything else. So, um, so Scott, you talked about biology and I, I want to, I want to kind of go there a little bit because, you know, we're talking about regenerative seed growers and obviously you're not organic, you know, you use herbicides as a tool when needed because in your brittle arid environment, you know, that's a better tool than tillage, you know, uh, to be able to do that. But talk a little bit about some of the biological products that you're using, what they are, what they're doing, and how that is reducing your reliance on commercial fertility. Absolutely. I, I think that makes us kind of a unique area as well as uh, we're, we're a very sandy soil. Uh, we're a high pH. I mean, so we're growing soybeans on 8.3 pH soil here. Uh, but we have high calcification as well. So the first thing I did is, uh, I mean, we're going way back is, is instead of using just 32O and 1034O or MAP or MES, uh, we start throwing a little sulfur out there, right? Just lowering our pH and putting that soil to work a little more. From there, we moved into humix, both raws, then dries, then processed, then liquids. And uh, then at that point, we got introduced with the guys with Elevate who are saying, hey, we're actually creating a concoction that you can put in furrow or foliar. Uh, for me, I've set up for liquid years ago. I quit putting the dries in. There were years I would go dig for seed and find the previous year's little granular of foss in the ground. We were so dry. Uh, so we switched a long time ago, both our planter and our air drill or shank drill into a liquid so that we had that more available. And then when we got introduced to Elevate and uh, their product called Hypergrow, that was kind of a big game changer for us is showing that getting that biology alive in the soil with these products, waking it up and putting it to work and freeing up all these tied up products that we've been putting in for ages. Um, again, I had gone back and I had tried, I was a believer in the cover mix. And I really wanted to get that in there, but we just didn't get the rainfall. So I feel like I tell everybody what these products are, these biologicals we're putting in the soil are that supplement that you just couldn't get out of growing a green crop. You couldn't keep something alive on the soil for whatever dynamic is this, going to the biological aspect and introducing them into the soil. And uh, I built my program, my Simple Farms program. It's a margin analysis, managing the numbers. And uh, I just wanted to see if we couldn't keep shifting dollars, not necessarily adding more dollars into our program, but shifting maybe some of our 1034O dollars into these other products. And I can tell you at this point, working with the Elevate guys and a couple other companies we work with, uh, this is gonna be the first year where you're putting zero FOSS down on our ground. We've done trial fields and uh, we're done. We've got so much tied up FOSS out there in this high calcification soil that uh, we have just shifted the dollars more into the biologicals and put those to work and uh, free this up. And uh, we've had great success. Uh, wheat last year, uh, we were delivering to our location, Weston Grain, just south of us. And uh, they ended up setting a, an entire grain bin aside the elevator for us. Our quality exceeded everyone's. Uh, we were a dry, going right into summer we got pretty dry but we just held a consistent 61 62 pound test weight on the same variety west bread variety wheat that they're doing in western kansas eastern colorado nothing special on the seed but uh we just had a healthy plant and uh, we were 13 and 14 protein on that on those plants and we held consistent throughout they told me we helped them move two trains out with the mix and blend to get the other qualities of 58, 57 pound wheat out of here because mm. we had healthy soil. We had a healthy plant, a healthy, healthy seed, even with extreme strong. I mean, we turned dry, we turned hot and dry. And, you know, the old worry about maybe being shriveled up a little bit, losing test weight. And that didn't occur because we had the good biology in the soil. Well, I hope, I hope you got compensated well with the premium on that work. I, I did. I, I those guys, Weskin Grain was very good to me. Good. Very good to me on that. Well, and and who else? You know, who else can say, yeah, the elevator has a bin just for my product. I, so much. I mean, that's pretty cool. It, it was an honor. 
It was an honor. We uh, we did a Simple Farms presentation here a few weeks ago, and they came in and uh, had that conversation with the other producers around. As they did, they flat out told them we held a grain tank for Shimer's operation. Yeah, and and so that'll maybe move us into you know the actual you know purpose of these webinars is to talk about how growing seed in a environment like you you when you're using these regenerative practices uh how that translates to better seed you know john kemp was on our first webinar and he talked a lot about the science and stuff behind it but that's what you're seeing you know in that higher protein higher test weight wheat that's exactly what he said you know the best seed larger seed size heavier test weights you know that's just an indication of being nutrient dense uh high, you know the higher protein same way so uh, you know, talk a little bit about, you know, you, you're fairly new in growing seed for us. You know, this is your second year. Uh, but, you know, do you think and have you seen, you know, have, you know, over the years, have you saved some of your own seed and replanted it, whether it be, you know, these cereals or millet or any of these things? Have you noticed the difference there between, you know, other seed sources that you've gotten? No, Keith, we haven't. Uh, not in that aspect. Uh just I, I don't take the time to s store the grain separately, segregate it out and clean it. So we're pretty much sourcing all our seed from somebody else. But what we do do is uh, we use that, uh, and I apologize, all of a sudden I can't, grain sense. We use the grain sense tester. And uh, so we're always ch checking the quality of our grain. And the one that we really saw too was it, it does a pay out there. But we got good test weight corn. I mean, for eastern Colorado, what we go through and dry land, uh, we get very excited about if we exceed 60 pound test weight. So when we're in that 61, 62 pound test weight, we're, we're pretty excited about that around here. Uh, the other thing is, is though we were using that tester just to see what kind of dynamics we're seeing in the seed and our protein levels. Uh, I think a standard on corn was 10 and we were showing 13 to 15 protein levels on the uh, corn. And it was consistent. It didn't matter whether it was a decal or a channel. Uh, it, it was very consistent on that end. And uh, so we're having dialogues with uh, the feed yards that we're delivering to. Hey, we can bring you a higher protein source. Right now, they're, they're nutritionists. They don't much care about that. They just pay the same price. But uh, we'll, we'll keep, keep the uh, statistics going on that. Keep checking all those values. And uh, maybe someday that'll translate into something more with a little value added. But uh, we do see that. We see a lot better quality. Yeah. Uh, I run the combine. Uh, could definitely tell consistency. Uh, all the trucks have got to report back to me every single load. And uh, we're way more steady and stable on our test weights. And you know it, test weights exponential in a field's yield. And uh, that translates as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, the, the late great... <laughs> Dave Brandt, you know, one of the pioneers kind of of the the soil health movement, he was seeing the same thing in his corn, you know, that extra quality, the extra protein, the extra nutrient density. And he did eventually find a hog feeding operation that would pay him on the value of what he had. So, yeah, my encouragement to you would be to hang, hang with it. Uh, you know, you've got lots of trucks in your area. You can ship that corn as far as you need to, to find someone who will actually pay you on its value because, you know, there definitely is value in, in what you're doing and what you're growing. Um, so you've talked about it a little bit. You've talked, you know, you've mentioned the Simple Farms program. Uh, tell us a little bit about what that program does, you know, how you came to develop that, and then how you're using that to help make management decisions to, ensure that you're doing the right decisions by, you know, going to rye and, you know, doing this diverse rotation versus the way that grandpa did it, the way that many of your neighbors still do it. So. Well, I, uh, I grew up in a family, a financial planner. My mom is, my brother is. Uh, so the, the stock markets, <laughs> even tax shelters was an education in junior high for me. Uh, so when I took on the farm at the age of 19 for my granddad, uh, I mean, uh, right from the very beginning, it was uh, numbers. Everything in my world was numbers. And uh, I was always wanting to figure out exactly what our cost of production is. And uh, so early on, I tell everybody, three eyes show. I can remember I bought a 
farm logs, I think it was. It wasn't farm logs. One of the farm programs. I mean, it was floppy disks and VHS videos to watch to learn how to use the program. Mm -hmm. Oh, my gosh, the data entries and the redundancies and the nightmare of it. And uh, so I bailed away from that, went into spreadsheets, uh, then jumped into a new program. Uh, maybe some of you guys remember Apex. Uh, that was kind of the one that threw me over the cliff with John Deere, it's the cost of it. Uh, at that point, as well, I was having dialogues with my local banker, who was one of my best friends, is, hey, how are farmers figuring out their, their cost of production, where they need to market? And he says, uh, Nobody's showing us anything. You know, guys are coming in with the napkins about how they perform that year. And uh, then I got, we, we'll call it a midlife crisis through the whole dry spell of the early 2000s. And uh, the opportunity came up to be the grain marketer at Cargill here in Cheyenne Wells. But man, this is the opportunity. I'm going to be on the road meeting farmers, trying to get them to sell bushels to Cargill. And uh, I got on the road and covered from I-70 South all the way to the Panhandle of Oklahoma and uh, I would say 95% of the producers I met with had no bookkeeping program out there that knew exactly what their cost of production was. And that kind of was the point there. On top of me being involved with another startup company that inspired me to develop a program, I got in and said, I'm going to build my own program. And uh, so I took my spreadsheet concepts and uh, found a development team in Denver, Colorado, and uh, off we went and built Simple Farms program. And my concept was, is just almost gamifying spreadsheets, simplifying it to a level where you could plug in all these details of what we're doing. You guys know it, all the different inputs we put in with our planter or with our sprayers and uh, putting it all together and it immediately telling me what it's cost me to raise that corn crop, that wheat crop, that milo crop, and exactly where we need to be marketing that. So for me, uh, I use the tool to make decisions on lease structures. Uh, fallow. Fallow has been the most devastating these last four, few years, especially limited rainfall and these poor market prices. Other than that nice little rally last year right at wheat harvest, um, our margins are so tight and so difficult to actually price at these levels and make any kind of money. And uh, I was trying to find other opportunities, and I kind of foresaw that green cover was really taken off with the cover mix and I knew rye was kind of the staple and uh, I couldn't do cover crops but I could sure grow grow a seed crop here and taking out a fallow period and putting that in right after a millet milo or corn crop uh, even if I lost $20 an acre was better than spending 90 days an acre, an acre $90 an acre keeping that ground clean trying to skip, struggle for that next year's wheat crop and uh, so th that just anything to get myself where we're cash flowing better and not tying up such big dollars for each year's of production was kind of the vision I got out of the program. Uh, probably the biggest one is I developed my own program, launched it in 2019. And even I lacked the discipline here during July, August last year, my program told me I should be marketing more bushels because uh, we were in the black. And uh, I was optimistic about the markets. My analysts were that I hire to tell us where the markets are at and I didn't pull the trigger. And uh, that is definitely a discipline I've even learned down my own program. If it tells me I should be marketing at a certain level, I will be doing that this year. So even the guy that built the program <laughs> can still make piss poor marketing decisions. And <laughs> so my program doesn't give you all the answers. I, uh, I developed it basically just to give you perspective on your operation, uh, where are we at, on uh, these inputs, what's this crop do for us? Uh, what's my lease structure work with my landlord? You can look at anything like that. It, it involves everything you wanna look at on your farm and it calculates it out and discloses to you where you need to be at. So listen to your wife and listen to your data. <laughs> yes. You're exactly right. We're, <laughs> we get emotional and bullheaded and uh, <laughs> yet again. <laughs> Yeah. So see, tune in for farming advice, get life advice uh, for no extra charge, right? Right. <laughs> so if uh, I'm, and, and, and again, this is not an infomercial or plug for this, but if people want to learn more about that, I assume there you have a website they can just go to find out more information. They sure can. They can just search simplefarms.ag. Uh, I do warn there is a simplefarms.com. They beat me to the .com. 
And uh, that is a pop farm down in Arizona. I think they're quite successful, but that is not us. We are simplefarms.ag. <laughs> so. Yeah. Well, that lot, lots of things we could say about the pot farm versus the software, but we'll we'll let that go for another time. Yeah, Jonathan, just put it into the chat there. So, um, yeah, great. So I just want to encourage people as we've been going through this, uh, put your questions in the Q and A box. We're going to go and start answering those here in just a little bit. I got just a couple of other things lines of uh, discussion that I want to do here, but then we'll we'll get to those questions and and try to answer everybody's questions. But uh, uh, Scott, I think you had a few pictures. Do you have some pictures that you wanted to share and maybe just talk about so people can see a little bit uh, of some of the things that you're doing there? Yeah, I don't have a lot. So what I'll do is uh, I'll, I'm scrolling through my phone here. I'll pull them up off my phone. Um, not a lot. I'll, I'll show share one with the uh, just the the rice double that we just went sprayed through and how thick it is and kind of exciting to be able to run that planter through it. Uh, so I'll pull that up for you guys. Um, and it it looks a lot like the stripper cut wheat stubble. And and again, I just want to stress here that people from wetter environments too much residue is is an issue or a problem for you sometimes it is it is literally gold for people in in the arid west and so the drier you are the more important and the more valuable that is so just want to stress why that's such a big deal yeah we can see that now okay so this is stripper cut rye yeah this is stripper cut rye and this is the elbon and you guys can see too that the uh the volunteer. So I just hit this a couple of weeks ago. Um, boy, did it come on strong and in a hurry. I almost, I told the guys we should have put the cattle on that for a few weeks before I went and hit it. But uh, then again, it's windows, right? Timing, how long you got before you got to get gone to the next project. So on this one also, this is uh, right by the pivot. I went out to move the pivot, just snap this shot. And you can see the boom height uh, and the, just where the hubs are. This is a John Deere 616, so pretty big sprayer, pretty thick. But that's that's definitely what we're going to deal with this year. And I am excited about it. Oh, my gosh. And I've had so many neighbors come to me and ask me about it. Uh, I think I got one more next to it, just a little more perspective. But, uh, yeah. And and this is this this is one of your irrigated fields? It is. It is. Yeah. How, how would the how would the residue from a dry land field compare? Uh, I would say it's probably thirty percent less residue, okay. but just as good a height, just as good a height than the straw. And uh, this is an interesting one here too, Keith. Uh, this I know we did multiple strips of different populations, and this was a, almost a bushel per acre, and uh, you know a little heavier than we needed to be. We were just kind of playing around with population as well. We did not see a yield variability uh, based on population. So we found that actually the lower populations were just as fine and not quite as thick as stubble, but we had a better, better seed. Mm -hmm. but, uh, yeah. Yeah. And so if this would have been wheat instead of rye, would you expect to have 60% of the residue, half the residue? You know, how, what would you say there? I, I would say probably half from my experience of what we've had. And uh, it would have been lodged a little more. I mean, it, it hasn't mattered what variety I put out. And uh, it had been grayed a little more. It, it Where we're at, uh, the wheat stubble is already a little more broke down than the rice straw. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, good. You got any other pictures there you want to share? Not really. I am. I am poor about that. I, I need uh, to be better about that. I apologize. Okay. Well, for that. so before I, I know you got at least one other picture we're going to share <laughs> because you know before we go to the 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 Q and A, uh, one of the things I don't know if people saw this on the email that came out is that you're also a shrimp grower. Uh, so probably the largest shrimp grower in Cheyenne Falls, <laughs> right? <laughs> I would say we got Cheyenne County locked down for the shrimp industry. But uh, so this is kind of a fun thing. You you grow them. Part of it is for 
you know, you're selling some of them, but a lot of it is a novelty type thing that as you go to some shows and do different things with your simple farms, you're able to kind of leverage this into part of, of your display or part of your, your trade show, right? That's correct. I, uh, probably the biggest thing is, is, uh, I always like to come up with some crazy ideas. We got a lot of weird things going on on our farm, but I throw it out to uh, my help and uh, I say, hey, what crazy thing would you like to do? And one of the gentlemen that's with me, maybe some of you guys even know him, Jim Lingle, travels around and does uh, Cajun boils for uh, fundraisers. And he also helps me sell Simple Farms. So we were on the road and he has shrimp in his Cajun boils. And uh, he's like, I've always wanted to raise my own shrimp on the farm. And uh, so I said, let's do it. And uh, in doing so, I invited every employee the opportunity to invest in this project. And uh, so Jim and Julie and I are the ones doing this project. The rest of the guys didn't think they wanted to be involved. And uh, so we've been growing shrimp for two years, two and a half years now. And uh, it's just inside a shipping container with uh, a bunch of aquariums, basically clean new chemical totes that we cut the tops off of and uh, growing these babies inside. Uh, Julie just posted on the website and we just sold locally. So we fish them out of the tanks, drop them in the ice and uh, people come pick up a pound of shrimp. So my, my daughter kind of gave me guff the other day. Uh, we've been selling them for almost two years and I haven't had any shrimp at home yet. We've, we've been selling out so fast. We have a waiting list of 75 people and uh, so I went and fished some out, and uh, we have our own beef as well. So we had a surf and turf, homegrown, and uh, that was kind of fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's 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 super fun. And you said those are actually prawns and not shrimp, but very, very Correct. They, Yeah, they call them Pacific Whites. I mean, it tastes just like shrimp, but uh, yeah. they'll grow up to a quarter pound, and that's what we're trying to do now is grow them up to a quarter pound, which is a monster. <laughs> yeah, no, that that would be that would be fun to see. One more thing, Scott, before we we jump to the questions here, because uh, I didn't, I failed to really kind of address this earlier. Livestock integration. You're you're you talked about you know we could graze this or we've grazed that. You know, t tell us just a little bit about how you know because that's one of the principles of soil health. You know, how are you integrating livestock into the rotation that you have with with you know, both dry land and irrigated? How's that working or what do you do? So right now we've been doing custom cattle care. When I launched Simple Farms, I actually got myself out of my cattle operation and I uh, was lacking personnel. Since then, I brought in some guys. And uh, so this has been the uh, second year we're actually doing some custom grazing for others. And uh that makes it a little easier. You know, guys can admit to this too. I was that way as, oh, I can leave them on another week or two. And uh, then you kind of start to hurt yourself on the ground uh, doing this custom. I, I can kind of set more ground rules and uh, your cattle are off when I say they're off. And uh, I, I kind of get the emotion out of it. But um, we've been, we this last year, we did rye following our corn. And uh, so we were going to grow the, we were going to graze the corn stalks anyway. And uh, that rye came on through the winter and the cattle kind of nipped at it here the last three weeks. But uh, we were just wrapping up on just grazing about all the corn kernels and cobs off the field. So it, it worked great. It, it, you know, the cattle just maintained gain and condition and uh, looked really good. So uh, we're, we're just going to keep playing the balancing act of integrating them in with it. I, I think it's very important to put that in. Uh, we're also in bar involved in the carbon credit program with locusts and uh that's kind of a check mark bonus for them as well they want to see that and uh, help you on a higher payout on the carbon market as well so and what the heck you know the cattle market's phenomenal it's uh put, put this on these animals when you can't market this commodity anyway yeah that, that's a great point and we've got you know people interested in you know, you, you look at corn and it's, you know, maybe a break even at best. So, you know, we're really encouraging people, hey, take that, take that field that's you know is going to be your lowest producing field anyway. Don't plant it to corn, which is just going to be a break even at best. And, you know, if you've got your own cattle or if you've got access to bringing others in, you know, grow some forages, you know, graze them out on the ground. But but you can't just turn them out there and leave it. You know, you mentioned that, you know, 
you can you can take your soil health backwards pretty quickly with livestock if they're not properly managed. And so that's that's the whole key is you got to manage them within the system and then it can really be a benefit and a boost to to the whole system. All right, let's go to a few questions here. Robert uh, is asking um, a couple questions about, you know, uh, well, number one, your soil organic matter levels, you know, where are where did you start and where are they at now and where do you hope to go with them? Yeah, uh, my OMs are very low. They're crap. Uh, we've done the Midwest samples for years. We just switched over to Haney last year. Uh, we don't have organic levels. I mean, we just, we're so dry, so sandy, so arid. Uh, that is a big goal is to actually create something where we can dig up and actually see a humate in the soil. Uh, we got none. So uh, we got a long road ahead of us. It's going to take yeah. a lot of years of growth. Yeah. So you you got a number of things working against you. Number one, sand. You know, number two, <laughs> dry weather. And then number three, you do get very hot. And yes. that all tends to, you know, be uh, detrimental to soil organic matter. So and that, and again, that's probably one of the reasons why rye kind of shines because, you know, it's got a reputation of being a tough plant. It can get by on less. It's a survivor. And so do you think that's one of the reasons that rye is so well adapted because you have essentially very poor soils? I agree. Yeah. Yeah. I'm hoping it, it, our goal here is actually just to make wheat maybe a little supplemental on the corner and rye become our staple pour into our next crop rotation of corn or milo and uh, I'll pretty much eliminate wheat and the fallow. And uh, I, I'm hoping at that point our, our organic comes up. That's when we'll start seeing it. So if we can keep this ground out of fallow for six or seven years, I think that's when we can start to see that dynamic. Yeah, because because any gains that you would make growing a crop, you're going to immediately lose those in a fallow year. Carbon gains. Yeah, because you're not going to burn that up. And, you know, to that point, you mentioned it a little bit, you know, you grew a little bit of hybrid rye for us, you know, to the seed production. That's kind of an experimental thing with, uh, with green cover and KWS. The company is that we're able to sell the, the second generation of that hybrid as a cover crop. Uh, we have a license to do that, but I think, and, and again, Scott Ravencamp is a big believer in this too. There's a huge potential for hybrid rye in your area to be grown as a feed grain and sold to the feedlots because, you know, hybrid rye uh, is a huge yielder. You know, I mean, they're, you know, they did a bunch of research in Akron, which, you know, is similar to your environment. They're seeing 100 plus bushel hybrid rye yields on dry land environments. And so hybrid rye is definitely something that we're going to be looking at uh, as a, now it's expensive, you know, the seed is, it's like planting corn, but if you can get a hundred plus bushel and sell that as a feed grain to a feedlot and have all that residue that you're talking about, because it's still going to leave that residue behind, could be a big game changer for crop rotations in that area. Um, you know, Robert's also asking about the carbon nitrogen ratio of the hyper cycle. And I, I don't know that we even know what the actual C to N ratio is on the product, but it's definitely lowering the C to N ratio of the field when you put it out there. Cause I, I, my understanding is it has both the biology and some of the enzymes and stimulants that just speed up the biological degradation of the residue. Is that correct? That's correct. And Robert, yeah, that's where I, I am. That's out of my realm. I lean hard on those other guys that represent elevate ag and, uh, lean on their science and uh, sometimes I get glazed over when they start explaining all that to me. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, so yeah, I don't know what that, that ratio is. And then with our uh, high pH levels, I don't know if that changes that quite a bit. And uh, so we're just kind of dabbling on it and uh, getting started to see what we see out there on the field. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so Again, be careful about doing it. You know, the, the, fir the your first consideration, in my opinion, is is make sure your equipment is as well adapted as possible to get through as much of the residue because it may be a pain now, but you'll you'll thank me for it later, kind of a thing. Uh, but then, you know, and and I'm assuming you're doing this mostly in irrigated, where you just have 
a lot more residue. Uh, that that's correct. Right now, the irrigated we did mess with it just a little bit last year in some dry land where we had some seriously heavy residue that we were going to shank mill it through, and uh, we weren't sure we were going to get through it with the shank drill. And uh, we fought it even after we put this down. But what was interesting, and nobody can really answer it, but uh, my hired help even pointed it out, is they felt like we had a lot less weed population in that field, whether it's because of soil health or did we put some harm to the seed that was there because we were breaking down the dry matter? Did it did it go after the seed population as well? We don't know, but uh, we definitely saw that. That was a visual Mm. antidotal feature with yeah that. so maybe the increased biological activity helped eat up some of the weed seeds that were laying on top of the soil that's what we asked the guys at elevate and they wouldn't say yes that would happen or not but they thought that was quite interesting. it makes sense and and the absolute best place to have weed seeds in your field is on top of the ground worst yeah. thing you can ever do is bury them because <laughs> they'll survive for years down there but if they're on top of the ground Something's going to eat them. Something's going to want to break them down because they're a food source. They're a food yep. source for all those critters and all the biology. So yeah, that's that's a that's a good plan there too. And you know, and again, from an equipment standpoint, if you can consistently have big residue crops and the, you know the hoe drill or the shank drill is the problem, then you know looking at a disc drill, you know, because you could cut through it then, you know, with a rolling cutter versus a, a static shank that you're dragging. And so, you know, you may you may have to graduate to <clears throat> to higher rainfall equipment there, Scott, if you keep doing such a good job. Well, that that is our hope and our goal, but uh, we're we're a little ways from it yet. But uh, yeah, that is definitely my hope and goal. I did have a disc drill, but it was a little soon, and uh, we sized too much residue and ended up blowing. So it's a tool that fits. It's just we got to use it in the right application. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Robert's asking some questions too about your pH and you said some of it is eight, three, you know, are you kind of seven, five to eight, three on a lot of that? Yeah. You know, our best soil, our best production areas are a seven, five. That's as low as we go as a seven, five, uh, eight, three is our highest. Yeah. But, uh, we yeah. are, we have eight, three circles. Uh, the most of our circles are a little sloped and uh, sandy and we have an eight, three there, but, uh, last couple of years we'd be able to, been able to avoid the chlorosis completely by putting the biologicals in. And uh, this year we've got a circle that was the rye from last year. So I'm very excited to put the beans through that one and see how we do there. Yeah. Because, because one thing that, you know, we've, we've seen time after time is in environments where you have more carbon, you know, more, whether it's organic matter or, you know, long-term carbon or carbon that is cycling through the system, the, pH matters less because the system can buffer itself. So whether you're low, like in our area, you know, we have a lot of low fives. Your area, you have, <laughs> we just need to get our soils together. We'd be about average <laughs> yeah. there. Stir but, <laughs> uh, you know, that, that carbon, the carbon allows it to buffer, you know, right where that root is growing, right, right where all that biology is growing. And so, you know, when you're using some of these products that help with the carbon levels, when you have the root exudates from your growing plants, you know, that's liquid carbon that that helps that whole system uh, do that. Uh, so Teron is asking here, he says uh, he has been tasked with helping dryland farmers in San Juan County, Utah, right on the Utah, Colorado border, 7000 feet moisture like you 12 to 13 inches, uh, mostly coming during the winter. Uh, would your type of system work in an area like that? You know, they're doing wheat fallow, safflower fallow. So probably the biggest difference is they're just higher elevation. But do you, do you think a similar system would work? I absolutely do. I was actually just over there because uh, we had regional basketball over at Dove Creek in that area. And uh, I think the biggest thing I'm seeing with a lot of those guys is they're still tilling. Oh, my gosh, all that ground was worked, everything. Um First, try to get those guys to at least try a little no-till. Um, a lot of them have gone to hay over there. Uh, they were big bean country, but they're more cash revenue with the hay. Uh, so integrate some of this stuff with their hay. Maybe go with the rye for the hay instead, you know. And, and uh, yeah, I, I know exactly where he's talking in their soil. It's red as can be over there. It reminds me of Oklahoma. But, um, 
yeah, I think a lot of these rotations will throw these rotations in, put these varieties in. And, um, yeah, I absolutely do believe it'll work over there. The only one they probably won't be able to get away with, obviously, is Milo with that altitude and time frame. But everything else, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And, <laughs> and again, you know, in arid areas – where you know moisture is always the limiting factor if you've got livestock you know it it takes about half of the moisture that a crop will need to to grow the majority of the biomass and then the other half to get it all the way out to mature seed so if you only have half the moisture well you can still grow a lot of biomass run it through a cow instead of a combine the majority, you know, the majority of the nutrients, the majority of the carbon then cycles through that animal stays in the field and that's that's a way better path towards building soil health than taking hay off, removing 100% of those nutrients and carbon. And unless you're bringing manure back, then, you know, that carbon is lost off of that. So, you know, anything that you can do to get the livestock back on the field, move some of those acres into a grazing situation, it, it's not done very commonly because it's a lot of work. It's hard work. But, but again, systems, you know, you get a good fence system, you get people that understand cattle, you get the right cattle. You can't, can't just bring feedlot cattle out there and have them be high performers on that type. So, you know, we'll, we'll have future webinars. We've got lots of information on our website about people that have done that and are doing that and doing it very successfully, especially now. You know, those guys look like geniuses now because <laughs> the crops stink and cattle are are the gold mines. So, uh, but that, that would be, if nothing else, try to get a demonstration farm like that started in the area to let people look at. I, I think too, Keith, uh, if you can find a way to take care of cattle for somebody, it's, it's a, it's a nice cash revenue. You can learn a little bit about cattle that way. And instead of hauling the hay off, bring them in, just like you said. And, uh, I could tell you, once you put word out that you've got a place that you'd put cattle for somebody, they, they will show up. They will call you. Uh, it never ends. Uh, they would love to put the animals on your property and take advantage of that and save you from having to haul that hay off. And yeah, it'd be, it'd be just like growing shrimp. You'll have a waiting list of people that want it, right? You will. They, you let them know. You just get word out there. It is mind boggling. Yes, <laughs> the shrimp too. <laughs> That's right. And Tron, you could probably grow the heck out of shrimp in, in that area as well. And you could uh, sell that all day long. So well, Scott, we're kind of up against our, our time here. I think we've we've kind of covered most of the questions here, but uh, closing thoughts, you know, for somebody in an arid environment like you, maybe they're still fairly traditional, you know, what would be a piece of advice that you give them for how do I get started? You know, what what would be a good low risk first step to try to do? Is just pick a field or a couple fields that you have and, and try a little diversity on it. Whether you want to try no-till first or you want to try a new crop, you don't have to go all in. Uh, there's no reason anybody has to go all in on anything. Just try it. But uh, I, it's kind of a lesson like I, I'm a, I'm a craps player and I teach people how to play craps. The only way you're going to learn is put your money on the table and write the check. There's just no other way. You can ask all day long, but get your feet wet some aspect. If you don't have the equipment or anything like that, Find a neighbor, somebody that's got it, have them come in and just do a little uh, a little test plot, trial run, lease the equipment, but but try to change. Uh, we have such a narrow window of time to actually learn and change our operations. Uh, I've been at this 33 years. I go to these conferences, listen to these guys like Keith, and my biggest regret is not doing it sooner. It honestly is. is I wish I'd have been a little more aggressive sooner from what I've learned now and uh, just to make my ground a better soil. Well, keep up the good work out there. Thank you for being a, a good example of what, you know, utilizing some of these regenerative principles can do. We look forward to, you know, the rye crop that you're growing for us this year. I would guess that there's even people on this webinar listening or that will watch the recording that will actually plant some of the seed that you're growing, which I think is kind of cool. I think that is cool. Fun. So thank you, Scott, for joining us. Uh, folks, we will be back again next week. Uh, John Hearman, uh, another one of, he not only grows seed, he cleans a lot of our seed. In fact, he cleans a lot of the seed that Scott 
grows. John is out at Haxton, Colorado, so still out in that eastern Colorado area. Uh, John's a great regenerative farmer, a great seed grower, a great seed cleaner. Uh, he'll be sharing some of his operations, some of his experiences, what he's learned, uh, and we look forward to that conversation. So hope everybody can join us again next Wednesday at noon for the next session. So thanks, everybody. Have a great rest of your week, and thank you again, Scott. Uh, Keith, thank you so much. Thanks for everybody coming on.